Good afternoon readers, it's Tilly here from Tilly Shelf. So in the video that I made on Monday in which I noted that I had reached a thousand subscribers, somewhat surprisingly, um, a few of you were uh, kind enough to mention that you would be interested in more videos from my Stories from Ukraine project that I started earlier on this year in which I read and review books that have been written by Ukrainian authors, um, which I have yet not got very far with in terms of video making, but I have got fairly far with regards to reading. Um, so today I'm going to be bringing you my relatively detailed, I think, uh, but generally spoiler-free review of Death and the Penguin by Andrei Kirkov. I really like that cover design, I have to say. Um, so Death and the Penguin is a book about a man, a penguin, and a complex web of post-Soviet vigilante justice. Um, and it's a fascinating book and I'd strongly recommend it if you just want the headline, uh, that, that's what I'm going to say. Um, but to go into a bit more detail then, um, this is a book by Andrei Kirkov, who's one of the best known U Ukrainian authors outside of Ukraine. It was written in 1996 and from what I can see was potentially originally self-published um, Kirkov um, self-published his own work to start out with and even sold it on street, street corners until he got picked up by uh, major uh, publishing companies later on. Uh, for a book that was potentially originally self-published, the quality is, is really fantastic. Um, it was translated in 2001 and it remains one of the most popular Ukrainian books outside of Ukraine. So Kirkov has a bit of a theory about why he's so uh, well regarded internationally. Um, and that is that he thinks that a lot of Ukrainian authors tend to be quite introspective and write about Ukraine's problems um, for an audience that already understands it. And up until pretty much up until this year, um, that hasn't been a very wide audience, that hasn't, uh, not many people have wanted to get into the, the details and to understand uh, Ukraine's issues and to read a book that already expects them to have that knowledge. Um, Kirkov tries to be a bit more open and a bit more comprehensible and perhaps um, for his his stories to, to have maybe a, a broader applicability. Um, I don't know how much that's the case, but I would say in all of the Ukrainian books that I've read so far, this was the one that was... Um, Probably the most accessible, easily the most accessible, in fact. Um, so Kirkov as an author was definitely one of the first and most frequent recommendations um, that I had when I said that I was starting this series, particularly uh, the novel Grey Bees was recommended both on and off YouTube. I think it might have been Joe Smith who recommended it. I haven't read it yet, but I do intend to because I enjoy this one so much. Um, Kirkov himself has been quite prominent in interviews and essays, both um, before the current conflict and, and during it. Um, he has made a, a huge effort to explain the Ukrainian situation in his work, but also um, outside of it, um, like I said, in interviews. Um, and he has said that he's found that people <laughs> typically, when he goes to do talks and things, they're much more interested actually in Ukraine than in his actual fiction. Um, so he's taken on that role for himself to be a bit of an informal ambassador for the country um, in terms of explaining the, 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 the unique culture and history there. Um, he's been quite politically open and he's written about uh, the conflict over a number of years um, and that included his Ukraine diaries which uh, led which were around the period of the 2014 Maidan um, up and uh, up until the annexation of the Crimea uh, I haven't read the, that book yet but um, it, it definitely sounds like it really encapsulates that time period um, if you're interested in going back to some of the the recent history of the conflict and um, he writes in in Russian, but has recently expressed that he is um, intending to stop that or intending for his works to be only published in Ukrainian or not published in Russian. Um, just as an, an aside, really, I I have to say that my understanding of um, Ukrainian and Russian and the blending of the two languages has massively increased um, through this um, through this project that I'm doing, as well as uh, through other sort of experiences this year. Um, and I I do think that. I would be interested to see whether he follows through on this statement because I, I think it's a shame to negate this aspect of his identity and also the identity of thousands of Ukrainians. I think suggesting that you, people who speak Russian are automatically Russian or that for you, a Ukrainian to speak Russian is a bad thing um, and makes them less Ukrainian sort of plays into Putin's narrative in a way and, and plays into that argument that that... Um, Ukrainians who speak Russian shouldn't be in Ukraine. So I, I do see that it as perhaps slightly undermining and a slightly inaccurate representation of how people live because Ukrainians have been speaking Russian in Ukraine for hundreds of years, um, whether that was while Ukraine was an independent state and, and, and when it hasn't been an independent state. Um, so I guess that it's 
when you it, it's easy to hear people saying oh these ukrainian speaking people are going to stop speaking russian and think that, that that's a positive thing but actually it is potentially um exclusionary and, and discriminatory towards those ukrainians who have always spoken russian as a first language um but see themselves as ukrainian and, and don't necessarily have the 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 bilingualism or have the resources and literacy levels and and um ability to to completely switch their language um in their adult life i think we should be open to the fact that people in one country can that, that one country doesn't have to be uh monolingual i suppose anyway leaving that aside let's get back to the story itself um so victor is our main character and he is an unsuccessful writer of newspaper fiction um at the start of the story he has no close friends apart from his pet which is a penguin um the penguin is called misha and it was adopted from a failing zoo um it it Originally, Victor adopted Misha because he was hoping that it might help with his loneliness. But instead, um, we get an, in a quote from the book, I'm going to use a couple of quotes dotted throughout this review, that Misha had brought his own kind of loneliness. And we talk about this, this um, Kirchhoff talks about the, the characters, Misha and Victor living in a sort of a complementary loneliness, an interdependent loneliness um, in his small flat, um, which I believe is in Kiev. And um, he writes newspaper fiction and a newspaper editor at the start of the book rejects his sto short story but instead hires him for a new role um, to write obituaries which are called obelisks for notable people who are not yet dead. Victor is initially quite wary of this idea. He's, his first reaction is what sit in office you mean and wait for people to die um, or wait for deaths um, but it's a paid job and he's not getting much success with his fiction so he can't really say no uh, he doesn't ask too many questions about it he thinks right I'm just going to give this a go and um, they're going to pay me $300 a month which is a decent amount of money so he's not too worried about it over the course of the start, first part of the story, his work brings him into contact with a range of local figures um, so that he almost starts to, to form friendships. He almost starts to form a network around him so that by the midpoint of the book, he ends up with a, a semblance of a normal life. Um, there's one point when it says that he lay open eyed with a curiously comfortable sensation of leading an ordered normal life for which the essential requisites, wife, child, pet penguin, were present. But the undercurrent to that is quite dark. We feel that something is going to go quite badly wrong for Victor at some point. We get the sense it's kind of one of those House of Cards type stories. Where we get the feeling that at some point something is going to get knocked out and everything is going to fall down. Um, there is, I would say, quite a gripping sense of foreboding. And the writing contributes to that, um, for instance, by having very compelling short chapters and repetitions of certain settings and scenes such as um, wakefulness at night. We see a lot of scenes where Victor is maybe pacing in his apartment or wide awake at night and you can tell how on edge he is even when he doesn't acknowledge it to himself and that just leads to the sensation that we have as readers that we should be on edge as well and we should be anxious about what might happen to Victor. At first he expresses to one of his new friends that he he's actually quite sad that his obituaries may never be published um, and that, you know, he's putting all of the, this time and all of these hours into writing about these um, prominent figures in society, but all of them are still alive. Um, however, a turning point at the start of the book occurs when one of the people that he has written an obituary for dies in mysterious circumstances. From that point on, Victor starts to more actively perceive a sense of threat. He starts to receive cryptic advice to, that he needs to lie low. And... Um, and things start to unfold from there. His obituaries typically are about people with some kind of secret, such as corruption and scandal. It's not necessarily that they deserve to die, but there is a sense that there is perhaps a degree of justice to their deaths, um, which crucially is revealed in the obituaries, in the work that Victor does. His, his writing presents the reasons why these people are perhaps not the most upstanding of citizens. Um, we get the sense that this this story pay, plays into, or the, the things that, that Victor is part of, is part of something much, much bigger. Um, but Victor chooses ignorance. He starts to see that something is going wrong, and he decides that it, it, 
the, the thing for him to do is to stop reading the news. He stops wanting to know which of his obituaries have been published. He just keeps fulfilling them, writing them about the people that he sent uh, the, the information for and, and just tries to ignore what happens from then on. In a way, his approach to carrying on as normal and ignoring the danger surrounding him uh, represents the typical reaction of ordinary people to intensely abnormal events. It's so much easier to treat them as though they don't exist um, than to acknowledge the, the, the risk that somebody is under. He recognises that there is a danger, but he finds it easier to continue his life. Um, and he, he talks about hauling a burden rather than changing it. Um, so there's one quote where he says, harnessed as he was, it was a question of hauling his load until he dropped. So he hauled. And just this feeling that he has, that he just has to keep going regardless, no matter what, and just, just see what happens at the end of it. The denouement to, to this, the, the resolution to all of the 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 steps that Victor goes through and the increasing sense of threat is absolutely phenomenal. It's fantastic. It really, really worked for me. Um, there were just two things that I wanted to uh, draw attention to. One of them is a negative and the other is a positive in terms of how themes are handled um, in the story. The first one is just to, to mention about sex. Uh, so sex is... <laughs> unfortunately is used as sex often is in scenes written by male authors uh, not cr a criticism just of Kirchhoff but just something that I've noticed as a young woman reading books um, in books by male authors from a male main perspective um, sex is presented as a way for them to demonstrate the main character's emotions which they are unable to vocalize using actual words um, and it, sex enables them to vent those emotions um, to a female recipient um, and all that the female participant has to do is receive those emotions and accept them and unquestioningly and just carry on as if nothing has happened. Um, I should say that this is a consensual if unequal relationship and you could say that the relationship between Victor and his romantic interest um, is a parallel to Victor his own relationship with the newspaper that is forcing him to work on these obituaries um, so you can see a degree of literary merit in this it's just that I've seen that kind of scene written so many times now um, so it, I did find a degree of frustration from that and um, the the next thing that I wanted to mention more positively is the the penguin so the penguin's name is Misha and the the name Misha is um generally seen as being Russian and it's a reference to um, the word for bear the, the Russian word for bear and there is another character also called Misha in the story, and that is comically referred to throughout as Misha non-penguin. So there's Misha the penguin and Misha non-penguin. And Misha non-penguin is definitely a much more bear-like kind of character. Um, Kirchhoff has kind of referred to his use of his choice of the penguin as a character in this by saying that, that penguins are social animals, um, much as Ukraine, Ukraine under the, the Soviet state um, had an enforced social system and was kind of like a social network. And we have to remember that this, this book was written sort of around five years um, after the, the collapse of, of the Soviet system in Ukraine. So still very, very much fresh out of that system. And um, so without the, the, the social network of the penguins and without the social um, enforced social system of Ukraine, both Victor and Misha, um, we see them adrift. Um, and we even get Victor going to consult a penguinologist and the penguinologist says um, that the penguin is, re is depressed. And that is in a way a reflection on, on Victor and the entire uh, society that he is based in at that point in time. Um, we also see an odd complete acceptance of the penguin um, by everyone that, that Victor interacts with. There's a kind of like a, oh, it's, is that a penguin? That's cool. Um, and the penguin makes him a, a memorable figure. People notice him when he's out, uh, when he's out and about with the penguin, um, including attending events like, like funerals. They, they, they see the penguin at the funeral and, and that uh, provides kind of like a mental link for them. Um, but on the whole, um, the, the penguin is just accepted as, 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 as a part of life and it's not um, addressed in the way that you might expect a, a, a penguin wandering around the, the streets of Keith to be addressed. Um, <clears throat> as the as the like the penguin, Victor has no hope of really understanding what is going on around him. Um, but his decision on whether or not to save the penguin uh, when it comes into a situation of peril later in the book has a bearing on whether or not he will decide to save himself or act to save himself from the situation that he is increasingly getting into. Um, equally, uh, as, as it's been longer since I've read the book, another interpretation of the, the penguin that I'm quite... Um, 
that I've been thinking about a lot is the idea that the penguin could be um, a nod to the Russian bear and the, the legacy of, of the Russian system within Ukraine. Um, so it, the Russian bear, as it were, has been reduced to an impotent, nonsensical, uh, nonsensical state, a, n a nonsensical figure. Um, especially in the book as the penguin becomes associated with things that are out of place in a modern democratic society which Ukraine was uh, was then and is now increasingly uh, attempting to be such as being associated with uh, corruption and potentially killings and potentially darker um, undercurrents going on um, so the penguin develops this association with those things that are completely out of place and the pe penguin itself is out of place um, and it's a comment in a way that the, the, the vestiges of the Soviet system that, that were at that time strongly maintained within Ukraine um, were also out of place and yet still accepted and yet still seen with a degree of, of affection by uh, those around, around them. So that's one uh, possible interpretation of the penguin. So I found this book on the whole very absorbing. I enjoyed it so much that I ordered the sequel straight away, um, which is right here, Penguin Lost. Um, and I intend to read that fairly soon when I finish whatever else I'm reading at the moment. Um, and um, I just, yeah, thinking about what to read next by him. So I think I'm going to read Penguin Lost because it's a sequel to Death and the Penguin. And then I'm hoping to also read Grey Bees at some point. Um, I really enjoyed it and I strongly recommend it. And I hope you've enjoyed this next instalment of Stories from Ukraine. Um, please let me know if you are interested in further ones of these. It could potentially talk about some poetry by Taras Shevchenko, who is uh, one of the most prominent uh, poets from Ukraine. Um, or some work by Gogol, who uh, is kind of... Um, reflecting back to what we were saying earlier in the, the video about um, Russian speaking and Ukrainian speaking and, and what that means for identifying as either Ukrainian or Russian, um, who is, is sometimes seen as a Russian author or sometimes seen as a Ukrainian author. Um, I'm also currently reading Fieldwork in Ukrainian Sex by Oksana Zabushko, um, who wrote the first book that I reviewed for this, which was Your Ad Could Go Here, um, and we'll hope to bring a video about that at some point. Thanks very much for listening and take care.